You know, when we're talking about the power of Christmas, you know, we, we talk about, you know, a lot of times, and, that, and that's a great song. I, I, mean, I felt it was so appropriate in the theme, in the context of the theme that a verse, you know, that there's someone singing about the power of Christmas. But most of the time when people talk about the, you know, they use that phrase, the power of Christmas or this uh, spirit of the season, you know, it's usually thought in the context of tradition. It, and there is power in tradition. There is, there is especially when it's, it's done in faith and when it's done uh, clearly. You know, I mean, there's literally power running through the light bulbs of our nativity. But there is power when, that can come when people realize what we're telling the story in that nativity. And that the gospel is the power of God. The message it can come verbally, visually, it can come in song, it can come in many forms. And there is power in the, the message of Jesus Christ through the Christmas season. But, but not to be confused with tradition. Tradition is good. And, and, but I'm not, when I talk about the power of Christmas, I'm not talking about tradition. I'm talking about, you know, because those traditions can move the soul. It can move the soul. And it can be confused with transformation. And, you know, we can all be moved to tears um, and it not change us. But what can change us is the power of the Lord working in our lives, the supernatural power of God changing us and moving us, inspiring us. For the Christian, uh, Christ in Christmas is the hope the hope of our future, the hope in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Uh, that transformation took place when we became born again and we are being renewed in our faith. We are being trans continually transformed by the power of God in the many avenues that he uses in our life. I want to encourage you that that Christ, when I talk about the power of Christmas, I'm talking about the power of transformation of the Lord in your life. The power of transformation in your family, which is what I referred to last week and we prayed again this week. The power of Christmas. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, we have up here, we have the story of Christmas and starting out, this is how, let's read this out loud together. Here we go. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Now he goes on, it says, Joseph was a righteous man, and he did not want to expose her to public uh, disgrace as this was a scandal, you know, a scandal in, in the highest order in their culture. Not for real scandal, but it was perceived as that. And he had in mind to, to divorce her quietly. Then in verse 20, it says this, But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary a home as your wife, because what is conceived, say the word conceived, in her is from the Holy Spirit. He goes on to tell Joseph this, she will be, uh, give birth to a son and you, Joseph, are to give him the name Jesus, which is in keeping with Jewish tradition that the father gives the name because he will save his people from, from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said to the prophet, through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And we sang that earlier, that God with us is a Christmas song, is a Christmas song. You can just imagine, I mean, for a minute, what, Joseph, what was going through Joseph's you know, mind when he considered this. It means he, was, he put a lot of thought, not a lot, of, not a lot is written about Joseph. You know, but he was a very prominent figure in the Christmas story. You know, it doesn't imagine how he felt. You know, just from the natural perspective, you know, this beautiful young woman that he's going to marry. Um, and, and again, I'm not going to go into the Jewish approach to marriage, the betrothal and all that. The truth is there was a couple stages. 
Um, both had legality issues involved in it, but the ultimate they are married had not came from our understanding of marriage had not occurred yet. So you can imagine the confusion that he had, which should be natural. Maybe disappointment. I wouldn't, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say he felt betrayed in this. All of that would be natural. And yet, all those emotions that he's dealing with, he wanted to do the right thing. And so in his mind, in his processing, the thing is to protect her and not make a big deal about this. That, that's quite something. And yet in that, uh, you know, he is being told that, you know, potentially, you know, he's going to be a father. Matter of fact, in the dream, he says, the angel says, you know, don't worry about this. I want you to be his earthly father. That's, the message is not like that phrase, but in essence, he's saying, I want you to raise this child. This, is, this child's going to be the son of God, and you're going to be the earthly father of the impossible, of the impossible. You know, I, I think of fathers, uh, you know, we you know, wonder as fathers, I'm just speaking as men, as fathers, sometimes we, you know, I'm going to say the things that we don't say that goes on in a man's mind as a father. You know, sometimes we wonder if we're getting it right and we want to do the right thing. And we, we hope we get it right. Everybody expects us to get it right. And it's ingrained in our very nature as fathers to, to try to do the right thing. But, but we usually have a huge deficit in our ability to communicate that. And then, and then we, we feel even less of ourselves because we don't have that capability. And, and, you know, I'm speaking as a father. We don't say it, but that's how we feel. Good men don't actually complain about that. They just, in reality, that's how we feel about it. And, you know, as a father, you know, you think about when you first were told that you're going to have a child. What, what was that feeling like? You know, I was interested, I was watching, thinking about this, and, and I actually, on one of my Twitter uh, feeds, I saw this really neat video of a father being told that he, uh, a young man being told he was going to be a father, but it was on an airplane. I don't know if you saw this. It kind of made its way through the social media circles, but it's really, it's fairly recent, and it's, it's really special. And it, it's so, such a picture of a guy, okay, of how, you know, and, and so I, I, bear in mind, they've loaded onto the plane, they've got in their seat, and then the captain is requiring the man to get out of his seat and come to the cockpit. Okay, so, you, you know, with all the, what's going on in the world right now, you can imagine, you know, what's going through this guy's mind. So why don't you drop the lights, bring up the sound so they don't miss that first part, and let's watch that. Graham Jacobs at uh, 10F. Yeah. You want more? Please uh, ring your call button. Yeah, I need you to come up here. We've got an issue with your ticket. All right, uh, this is a special announcement for uh, Mr. Graham Jacobs, actually. And, uh, first of all, congratulations. Uh, you're going to be a dad. So, uh, anyway, he's going to be a father of 10 uh, uh, April 2617. And uh, the wife wanted us to make a special announcement for him. <laughs> Uh -huh. Atypical, nothing to say. <laughs> what do you say? You know, I mean, you know, you know, and, 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 and guys, do you relate to that moment? You know, 
I remember what it, you know, do you remember when you were told, you know, I, I remember, of course, I've had a few, so I, I've had a few memories. I was telling my wife that she's seen the first two, Rachel and Christine, when she said, uh, we're going to be, a, uh, you're going to be a father. She told me on a bridge, I'm crossing the 520 bridge for Rachel, and I'm crossing the Hood Canal bridge for uh, Christine. And, uh, you know, the good news is that she changed her approach a little bit with Garrett, um, and actually did something special for me, but uh, she wrote a poem, of which I subsequently lost. But uh, anyways, she, uh, she wrote a poem, and, um, but she actually kept it a secret for two months, but that's another story. Uh, the fourth one, she didn't have to announce it. I knew before she did. And some of you know the story, and that was when I were in Disneyland, and uh, I played a joke on her. She started crying, and I'm like, you're in the happiest place in the world. What's going on? You're pregnant. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yes, you are. <laughs> you're pregnant, and <laughs> you are pregnant, you know? And um, I, I've done this enough. I, you're pregnant. And um, we, we left Disneyland, went and got, you know, figured out, and sure enough, went to Albertsons, and she was pregnant with Aaliyah. <laughs> So Aaliyah is my little souvenir from Disneyland. But anyways, uh, and then Timothy, and Timothy, you know, it, it was just like my wife's prophetic bent comes out. And, and in all seriousness, she, she says, you know, God wants you to have a son. And I, she was, heard the Lord right. We have a son. And then with Lugina, we live very different. Obviously adopted. We're sitting literally at a dinner table in Haiti. We're meeting this little nine-month-old little baby for the first time, deciding, okay, is this God or not? And I'm sitting there looking at my wife, holding this little beautiful little child. And this little child looks up at her, looks down, looks around the room, looks up at Marilyn, and just puts her head right on her chest. And right then, I knew that's my daughter. You know, you know, as a father, you know, those, those first moments of realizing you're going to be a dad. You know, I mean, I'm, the whole other con- idea of, 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 of as a mother is different, but for a man, it's, 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 it's a special moment. And that first Christmas, there's this power of, of, you know, from the woman's side, you see a young virgin miraculously conceiving a child. A miracle. But you also have a conception of faith in Joseph. There's two miracles that happen place in this in this time period. The big one, obviously, is one that is fundamental to our faith in Christianity. One that is hard for people to 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 uh, you know believe in, to to grab a hold on. You know, when you talk about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the miraculous reality of of, of, of Jesus, he was, he was conceived as a miracle, and he finished his life on this earth as a miracle. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and he was rose from the dead. Those two bookend his life on this earth and communicated who he, who he is and who he was on this earth. This immaculate conception, is the conceiving by the Holy Spirit of Jesus in the womb of a virgin is a miracle. And it is fundamental to our belief in who God is and why he came. That he was fully God and fully man, both. Not either or, both. When Jesus came, and and the reason it had to happen that way is, and I'm not going to go into a big teaching of this, but, but the truth is the sinful nature is passed through the man, through the seed of the man. That's hard for some of us to comprehend. That's all right. When you get to heaven, we'll figure it out. But it's passed through the Father. The sins of the Father are passed. And the immaculate conception, the power of Christmas, the conception of Jesus Christ... He was without sin. He had no sinful nature. He was as Adam was. Just like one man's sin resulted in the, in the, the fall of humanity, one man's righteousness saw the restoration of that. 
And it is through the miraculous power of Christmas, of conception and resurrection at Easter that we celebrate. But that happened with Mary. But there was also another miracle in this Christmas story. And it is the miracle with Joseph. We need to, you know, put some weight in that reality that with this man, this father, that there was something that was conceived in him. It was a fearless faith. A faith that was willing to accept public ridicule and diminishment of stature because he was receiving a pregnant woman into his life. We have the privilege of the hindsight of the Christmas story to think, oh, that great, he did that. But it was a huge humiliating moment publicly. It was, it was I mean, you know, Nazareth was not a big town. It was actually a very small community. Squim would be huge. It, 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 if you want to say Carlsberg is big compared to probably Nazareth. So everybody knew what was going on. There was no secret here. He had to accept the public humiliation of this without complaint and love without resentment. And he did. Because there was this birthing of faith that allowed him to face the the setting to which he lived in. In addition to that, when it came time for Herod to try to kill Jesus, that same faith had to be breathed on again, and he was fearless and packed his family up and left for Egypt, which there's a lot in that, going back to Egypt. But he did. There was a fearlessness that was a part of Joseph's life that no one, it doesn't actually say it, but it's it's demonstrated through the story. And a byproduct of this miracle was faith, a fearless faith, being willing to accept scandal with love and confidence, without resentment. And this conception, this immaculate conception, was also followed with this conception of Faith, conception that this, this miracle of immaculate conception resulted in uncertainty. But the God then, at the same time, conceived faith in Joseph that created a fearlessness to move ahead. I've heard it said that our fears are sinful. They miss the mark as a Christian. As a Christian, we create our own fears by refusing to nourish ourselves in our faith. We let, we, there's a call this morning to let the Lord build your faith, to strengthen your faith, to renew your faith. I, I, it was a great phrase. Uh, faith is like batteries. They have to be recharged. Just like your cell phone needs to be recharged. Your faith needs to be recharged. And for our participation in it, we sow the seeds into our own soul. Are we going to let ourselves, are we going to let our hearts be the soil that receives the seed of the word of God. We're going to let that. Jesus is the author of your faith, and he's the perfecter of your faith. He is the one that is going to build it and strengthen it and grow it. But he does ask us to participate. You cannot look at a field if you're a farmer and see we, you know, grass or weeds and everything and look at it and go, <clears throat> well, God, I pray for corn. And then go sit down and, and it doesn't show up and you go, Where? God didn't answer my prayer. No, you have to get out there and you have to till the soil. You have to remove the weeds. You have to plant the seed. 
and, and squirm, you water the, water the field. But the truth is God provides the field. He provides the rain. He provides the seed. He provides all those things. And then even after all that, it actually grows, which there are so many things that can hinder that from happening that don't happen because God lets it grow and causes it to grow. And so for us, we need to recognize that there is a part to play in this growth of our faith, a participation. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith, but are we willing to sow the seed of that faith? Are we willing? And the truth is that it it generally comes from one avenue, and that is, as described in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Now, is that, is that talking about the Bible? Yes, and it's not just the Bible. It's the breath of the Lord on the message of the Bible. It's not just saying, it, it is saying that we have the Bible. The Bible. I'm not... I'm not diminishing the importance of reading the Bible. We're going to talk about it in a minute as a means of throwing seed in your soul. If anybody's been here any length of time, you know the value that I place on the written words of God. But in equal measure, you need this breath of the Lord on the words of God through you, the breathing of God, the word of Christ breathing into your soul. And that faith is what, that is what is the water of the seed as we are placing in it. God wants to birth a new chapter of faith. I can say this every quarter of the year or every month and be right and be prophetic because faith is not stagnant. It is always changing and growing for the new season, the new challenges. And God wants to, just like Joseph, miraculously conceive new faith But are you willing? Are you willing? Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 says, To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, your whole being. Are you willing? I want to stop and just pray for us that we would be willing to sow the seed this week. This week. So I want to pray for you. I'm going to stop just for a moment. I'm going to pray. Lord, I ask a blessing on all that hear these words. That truly with our whole being, with our own personhood, our whole persona, our whole personality, the wholeness of who we are, we would love you by wanting to participate in you growing our faith. No matter where we're at, I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. And as I prayed that prayer... The verse that the Lord, because I prayed for this earlier. Now I prayed for it again for you and for me. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16 came to my mind when, when, uh, when I was praying about this. And this is what the Lord says. So I almost feel like the Lord's talking back to us. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask me for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. And whenever there's that word soul comes up in the Old Testament, it is the one word that is used in the original language that really is referring about the, the whole being of the person, the person, the persona, if you want to say the personality of the person, that you, would, that, that you will find that part, that unique part of you is finding rest from the Lord. God wants to birth a new faith, and he wants to miraculously conceive in us a new faith. But the question is, are we willing? Because the rest of that passage in Jeremiah, he says, but you, won't, you, you, don't, walk, you don't want to walk in it. That's, that, that was the answer that God, he asked, God asks him a question that answers it. My belief is that you're not here to answer it that way. My belief is you're here because you do want to answer it I do want to walk in that way. And so for some of us, it's hard to do that. It's, it's hard to land this. When I'm think, talking about participating and growing our faith, it, it, it seems hard for us sometimes. 
Some of you, this is easy. And you're just being encouraged right now to continue. But some of it, it's hard. Some of it's hard. I want to encourage you that, you know, you know Mary's side of the story of this equation is, is mentioned in Luke. And when it says that Mary was wondering how could this happen when she was given foreknowledge of it happening, uh, she was told this, with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. That, that if you're willing, nothing is impossible in this area. And God made you the way you are. You are unique. Sometimes our uniqueness causes us to think more highly of ourselves, but more often it causes us to think less of ourselves. And I, I want to encourage you. You are unique. You are made the way you, on purpose. And you're thinking, well, what kind of idea was that, God? You know, the truth, it was his idea. And I've said this again. You were a good idea then. You're a good idea now. Psalms 139 verse 13 says, you were created, the psalmist says, you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's word. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. In other words, do you really know that you are made uniquely? And, and do you embrace that? You know, if you have children or work with children or work with any number of people, I'm going to state the obvious, that you have figured out that there are different personalities. People are different. And how you deal with this one doesn't work with this one. Have you noticed that? Okay. And, and just like they're different personalities, those personalities are connected on how we learn and how we grow. We don't all learn the same way. We're all different in some measure. Matter of fact, we're, we're different in the way we learn and the way we listen. And we often think of ourselves with, and in the context of the measure of faith that we've been given, the measure of who we are that God has given us. Don't, but we need to realize that both don't think of yourself too highly, but also think of yourself in, rea in, in a kind of a reality that there is a measure that God has given you already. And that you're not going to be like someone else exactly. There may be similarities, but they're, we're different. Each are different. Once the birth of Jesus occurred, a couple groups of people visited him. You had shepherds and you had magi from the east. The magi came far, the shepherds came from near. Both had a purpose, both encourages us, but both were not the same. And what got them there was different. One brought and when they left, one brought up a message of, left with a praise and a message, and one left resources. It was all different. And I want to give you something, something very practical this morning to help some of you. Help you feed your soul, your personhood, your persona, your personality with the seed of the word of God, that, that the Lord may cause it to grow, that he may conceive in you a, fear, a new fearless faith for what's ahead. You know, we look at the Bible, and it's a fascinating book. It's, a, it's obviously, the, the, you know, has the bestseller every year for thousands of years. It has been the book. As a matter of fact, uh, we're Christians are often referred to not as Christians, but as the people of the book overseas, the people of the book, the book. And, it, and if you read the Bible or listen to the Bible, you'll discover there are many forms of literature in it. It's just not one novel. It's a group of novels. It's a group of books. And each is different. You have poetic literature, you have wisdom literature, you have 
letters, you have historical set books, you have, you have the prophetic books, and those prophetic books are broken down. And one of the reasons why they're different is because, as Peter says, the people that were, were pinning it down were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So they participated in writing as the Lord guided them. As a direct result, who they were as individuals comes out in the style and the language of what is written. The personality of Paul comes out of the pages as much as the Holy Spirit's message. The personality of David comes forth in the Psalms, even as the Holy Spirit is guiding the words and is the words of God. It's a very an interesting Reality. You have this merging of a personality of the writer and the inspiration guidance of the, of the Holy Spirit. Why is that? You know, why did God do that? I, I, I think there's many reasons. But I think one of them is this. It is written partially this way. I, and this is, just, this is my belief. You don't have to buy this. This is Mike, not the Lord. I believe it is because the Bible is written partially the way it is in different personality types to communicate to different personality types. Just like there is a differing types of people that are going to consume it, so God allowed those different types to communicate it. And our personhood our persona, our soul, if you want to say it, and all that comes with that is the human part of us that influences how we listen, how we interact, and how we learn. And we all learn different ways. Seeing, hearing, reflecting, acting, doing, reasoning, memorizing. We all do it differently. Some of us are auditory learners. Some of us are visual learners. Some of us are, if you want to say, tactile learners. We physically learn better when we're actually working on something. We figure it out as we're, you know, okay, that's how it works, and we're actually doing. Unfortunately, our whole education system um, sets us up for certain types of learners, kind of in a mass approach. It's just, it is what it is. But we're all not the same. Some of us are extroverts, some of us are introverts. But the question is, how do you learn? Do you know? There are studies that have shown there is a direct correlation between a per the personality of a person and learning. How I learn, there is a direct correlation. Learning is often contingent upon reading skills. This is an interesting reality. And... And it's, it's a subject that is often avoided. And if people are really religious, they don't even give it much thought. When I, really, I use that with a small r and not in a positive sense. I've seen uh, this with expectations on pastors, called individuals, called to, to proclaim the message of the gospel, they're, they love people. They're never going to be probably a pastor of thousands, but they're going to reach people. Maybe they will be. I don't know. I, no one knows the future. But I have seen those individuals in our own system of Christianity in the United States be diminished because they don't read well. They're not learned they're more of an auditory learner. I, I actually am one of those people. It, reading is not, is not easy for me. It hasn't been for decades. I, I actually, I, to this day, I still see, see double. I, if, that's why I wear glasses, not to, well, I'm over 40, so I also have reading glasses, but, if, but regularly I wear them so that I, I know the church is actually smaller than it really is. No one got that joke. 
But, but the truth is, I, I have, and so for me, reading has always been an exhausting endeavor. I, I do a lot of stuff by listening. Listening to sermons or listening to, uh, the, list, li- listening to the word of God. I gain more from listening than I do reading. Some of you are finding that hard to believe, but it's true. I struggle with reading. People I, give me all kinds of reading books, and I'm like, thank you, but I'm looking at them. <laughs> I hope I get to it. I mean, my heart is there, but the flesh is, you know, not. <laughs> you know? And some, sometimes we don't realize that, you know, for me, I, I, like to, I, don't, I, like, I like the reading level when I read to be actually lower. It's why I, I've, I, I grew up listening to the King James translation, and so I can quote verses in the King James translation, but I, I don't enjoy reading the King James translation. It's poetic, and it's stood the test of time. It's a great translation, but the truth is, and put these up there, would you? It's at the 12th grade reading level. The average American is at sixth grade reading level. And so you got these really religious people who say it's King James. Well, okay, so what about the rest of us that don't read as smart as you do? Are we less of a Christian? Because we can't understand it? Well, I'm sure getting a silent moment here. <laughs> the NASB is at 11th grade. The NIV is 7th grade. Well, I can get to the 7th grade, so I'm okay with that. I told my wife when I, I'm actually at the New Century version. I actually have a copy, and that's some of my devotional reading. I'm at the third grade reading level most of the time. Boy, you are really encouraged right now, aren't you? <laughs> the pastor reads at the third grade reading level. I'm I'm actually okay with that. I'm I I you know I I pursued my education. I I got a master's at Northwest University. I, I'm not a I'm a lifelong learner, but I also recognize I, I'm not a great reader. And some of you out there, society doesn't allow you to even say that. Family doesn't allow you to say that. I'm here to tell you, God made you the way you are. And it's okay to be who you are. And you can be less than the rest of the planet. I'm okay with that. Some of you seem to be growing in your faith, showing up at Kingsway, so it seems to be working out okay. Okay? that you can still grow even though you feel like you're kind of behind the curve of what everybody says it should be. I, I don't have a lot of time to, but I want to give you just something really quick. Some of you uh, have dismissed this issue of literacy, but the truth is if you go overseas, illiteracy around the world is common. And oral communication of truth is really the, the, the most dominant means reaching the un the unreached in around the world, being able to tell the story. You know, I, uh, I, I listen to, uh, cassette, who still listens to cassette tapes here? I do, okay? My, my daughter needed to listen to a cassette tape for school, and she's like, how does this work, Dad? And I said, well, I had to explain to her, and, you know, no, this is not in the Smithsonian Institute. It still exists. And, uh, you know, anyways, it was really kind of a humorous moment. I do believe that God, even if in our shortcomings, he wants us to participate. And it's helpful for us to understand how we function as an individual. And I, I, don't, I believe the study of human nature is, has its place. It's been going on for centuries, and it's not absolute truth, but it does allow insight for me to understand who I am so that I can learn. Trying to understand through the lens of Scripture, what is going on? You know, this has been the study of people, persona, personality, soul, has been going on as early as 450 B.C., where the father Hippocrates, did I get that right? See, I actually had to go to my wife, the English specialist, how to say the word. In 450 B.C., categorized humanity into four categories. That, those temperaments have kind of carried through the centuries. There's multiple levels, and I'm not going to go into the minutia of that because it's confusing. 
But through the millennia, people have sought to understand our human behavior. And there are, I love the fact that uh, there are four ba- main categories that you can find pretty much in everything. Successful sitcoms, four main personality characters. God made humanity interesting, and so if you want something to be interesting, you got to have those four main categories in the story, or it's very shallow. People get attention long-term, like to see themselves in the mix of it. That adds balance to the characters and the dialogue that's going on. But most, of us, most good novels have that. I mean, if you think about it, The Wizard of Oz, put that up there, Wizard of Oz. Four personality types. Still carries to this day. You have the, you have the uh, ultimately you have the uh, spontaneous cowardly lion. You have the tender-hearted tin man. You have the pensive scarecrow, and you have security-seeking Dorothy. All four right there. You can take it down. Even in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have the emotion of Luke. You have the abstract of the Gospel of John. You have the brevity of Mark. And you have the orderliness of Matthew. Human beings are complex. And we never fully appreciate the differences that we have. That is why God has promised us that he will finish what he started. But he wants us to participate. We still have a part to play in this life that we have. And our own personality and learning style will help us understand how to start. Some of you are like, I don't want to hear this. Well, that's why I don't. Some of you need to hear this. You need to hear that you can, how you perceive and how you use information is based upon the way God made you. I love Gary Somali's description of, of uh uh, these different temperaments, and put, put up that first slide, if you would. Of basically, you have extroverted, you have introverted, you have task focus, you have people focus, and then you kind of fall into one of these four major groups with subsections, and he, and he, he uses animals, and I've had these for years. Um, some of you are like the lion. You know, you're extroverted and task oriented. You, 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 you tend to, you know, you, you're, 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 you're a type of person that, Ultimately, um, you take charge. You're a person that you know, wants to you know, get things right. You're a visionary. You're practical. You, uh, you're productive and strong-willed and independent and decisive. You tend to be a leader. You should consider reading the book of Mark or the Ecclesiastes or Proverbs or James. Those books are written in that kind of personality. What I'm not saying is only read those. I'm saying if you are looking for an easy path, an ancient path, to see your faith emerge, I'm giving you something very practical and simple to do. Take a look at these. Listen to them. If you don't read very well, like me, listen to them. Okay? You're wanting... Uh, something that is expected to establish a routine. The second the, the thing is, is, uh, is uh, I, we have here uh, the, what I would call the otter. Let's go back to the otter there. Okay, the otter is the outgoing. Okay, is the outgoing, responsive, warm, friendly, talkative, enthusiastic, compassionate. They're the party animals. Okay. Okay, I love this. Where do I go if I want to inspire my faith? Well, it's, by the way, the book of Revelation is a great place. Psalms, Gospel of John, written just for you. Written just for you. What makes sense to you is that it's, uh, there's a sense of justice and it has emotion, and it's enthusiastic, it's visionary, it's broad in general. And then... Uh, and then you have uh, what I call the golden retriever. Now, I had these four little animals for years. And someone must have really liked my golden retriever. It was the cutest one I'm out. And so I went to get it, and it's gone. So uh, some child really loved my golden retriever, I'm sure, but that's okay. God bless him. So my wife, I said, I need a dog. And she gives me a mouse. So, uh, <laughs> and she put a, no, this is really a dog. <laughs> Okay, 
You're the calm, easygoing, dependable individuals. Quiet, objective, diplomatic, and humorous. Okay? And everybody likes you. But you're not sure that everybody likes you. And what makes sense to you is a story. And the story is told. And, you're, and you like watching others. And that's how you learn. You ex- and you like exact research information. You, you and you're logical in your reasoning. That's why the Gospel of Luke, Acts, are really, you, you gravitate to those books. And why Hebrews is inspiring, or the Kings in First and Second Chronicles. Those are good. And then you have uh, the beavers. I tend to be lean towards a beaver. Um, yeah, the little flat, fat guy there. Um, <laughs> You know, you're analytical, self-disciplined, industrious, organized, sacrificing. What makes sense to you is order. You don't like things out of order. Develop, you like developing and testing things. And you just, you, you kind of have this general frameworks rather than very specifics. But so books that would be good for you. And I, by the way, when I, when I saw this, I realized, yeah, I actually read these quite often, uh, Matthew and Romans and Isaiah, Daniel and Jeremiah. By the way, not, not everybody is exactly this. Some, it's usually several things, but there's usually a dominant trait that comes out. And I think those traits change. The truth is, is that, by the way, this is a great book if you're a parent and you want to come up here and take a look at it, you can afterwards. Is the way they learn how to discover to teach your child's strengths. It's a great book. Um, if you're a parent and trying to figure, you can't figure out your child, this is a great book to help you figure it out. Why did I share all this? I just want to give you something very practical. The truth is God created you. As it says in Psalms 139, verse 13, he created you. He knit you in your mother's womb. He made you the way you are. Do you know who you are? Do you want to figure out how you learn and then look either here, because I want to go back to, if, if you have a struggle with reading, listen. Listen to the word. Find ways to listen to the word. But here's some simple areas that you can look and discover. As the Lord says to us prophetically this morning in Jeremiah 6.16, stand at the cross for me. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where... The good way is walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. The power of Christmas with our faith, it can be conceived just like the immaculate conception. It can be conceived in us like Joseph. It was conceived by the Lord. So I want to pray for you, and then we're going to conclude. Lord, I just want to thank you and praise your name. That Lord, that you are desiring to show us the path for each one of us to be lifelong learners in growing in you. And some of what I shared here, Lord, will be helpful to some. I pray a blessing on them, Lord, that you would help them take what I have spoken and they would discern what is from you for them. I speak that in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray a a new gift of faith will come forth as those that seek you will find you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. I hope this was helpful for you going into the Christmas season. The power of Christmas with our faith. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed. Grow in faith. Amen.